Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 1st of March and back to the regular day after last week's a little bit early in this. I did a cross country drive from Texas to Idaho. It took 32 hours nonstop in a 26 foot U-Haul. So that was lots of fun. As always, I have the chapters. Uh, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. And only one new video this week because I was away last weekend, but I dived into how with Azure DevOps, when my pipeline is talking to Azure Resource Manager, I can avoid any secret that I have to store or maintain using the uh, OpenID Connect Workload Identity Federation capability. So I dive into that. Something if you're using Azure DevOps and GitHub has it as well, which I did a video in the past on, uh, you definitely want to start adopting this. On to what's new. So on the compute side, there have been some API management updates. Remember, API management is about helping discover and expose the APIs in your company to other services. And there's a developer portal that gets automatically generated that provides documentation of your APIs, but is very customizable in terms of the layout, the pages, the style, the content. And it's how your API consumers can discover um, what APIs are available, learn how to use them, maybe even request access. And so what they've done is it's a new layout, gives you easier management of that functionality. It's gonna be easier to make sure it works on all different form factors and different types of devices. I can have different views based on different groups. It's got a redesigned API and little widgets to help the experience and just helping group useful resources based on your needs. For Azure Site Recovery, for my VMware VM workloads, so this is where it's doing that replication, I can now add data disks to an existing VMware VM and enable them for replication. So it's just now a lot easier. You'll see a health warning when you add a new data disk saying, hey, this disk is not protected. I can say, protect it. Once that initial replication has completed, that health warning will go away. AKS nodes now have a soak duration uh, in preview. So if I think about when I'm rolling out updates, it doesn't just do everything all at once. It typically goes, hey, upgrade a node, then the next node, then the next node. And what this soak duration does is after it's completed the upgrade of a node, rather than instantly going on to the next one, it's going to wait some range of time. Now, by default, it doesn't wait any amount of time, but I can configure from zero to 30 minutes. And the goal is in that time, if you imagine before there were pods running on a node and they got kicked off and went to another node, well, now the node is up and running, those pods can come back, but they're not instantly available. They may have to go through some processes until they're ready. Maybe I have some health check things I want to run. Well, I can set that number of minutes to make sure the pods that come back can be in that healthy, ready state to accept traffic and do work before I move on to the next node. So this is now available. I can now disable the network policy on AKS for two migration scenarios. So we have network policies, and this is really to help me define rules for the ingress and egress for traffic between pods in a cluster. And the ability to disable that is important for two migration scenarios. If I'm trying to move to CNI overlay, I can't have network policy. So I have to be able to disable that. So now I can disable it so I can migrate to CNI overlay. But also if I wanted to move to a different overlay, a network policy engine. So for example, Calico to Cilium, for example, well now I could disable it so I can go to a new um, network policy engine. AKS Istio based service mesh add-on has gone GA. So what this is, it's an officially supported and tested integration for AKS. So a service mesh is really a dedicated set of infrastructure layer that I add to my application. It transparently lets me add capabilities for the workloads in my pods, like observability, traffic management, and security without me doing anything in my code. So that the service mesh is adding that. So what this Istio based means is they took the open source Istio and they've done testing specifically for AKS. 
So there's been a lot of compatibility between Istio and the supported versions of AKS, um, minor patch version upgrades, uh, plug-in certificate authorities, managed external internal ingress, scaling of the Istio control plane components. So it, it's Istio, but they've just done some additional work to make sure it works phenomenally with Azure Kubernetes service. And then if I have capacity reservations, I can now use it with AKS in GA. So remember, capacity reservation lets me say, hey, in this region, in this zone, for this very specific SKU, I'm going to actually reserve capacity so I get an SLA that gives a financially backed guarantee. I'll be able to create resources into that capacity reservation group. And it's really like I'm booking the hotel room and I'm paying for that, that, that whole time. So I'm reserving this block of rooms and then I deploy resources into that block of rooms. So it's a way of ensuring I have that capacity. Well, now my AKS node pools can provision into a capacity reservation group so I can consume it through my AKS. AKS now has an in-place OS SKU migration. So think I'm moving from Ubuntu to Azure Linux. Now, instead of having to create a brand new node pool for Azure Linux and then move my workloads over, I can actually go through and using the standard node image upgrade process, it will go and, hey, move from Ubuntu to Azure Linux. Kubernetes 1.29 is supported in preview. And then Azure Functions now support HTTP streams in Node.js in preview. So the whole point now is my function apps can stream so I can have HTTP requests coming in and I can have responses going out. So if I needed some real time exchange of information, that interaction between a client and server using a HTTP connection, I can now do this with Azure Functions. So maybe it's I'm processing a really large amount of data, maybe it's delivery of certain types of content, I can now use my Azure Functions for that. On the networking side, so App Gateway now has TCP and TLS over TCP protocol support. And obviously that's a, a layer four uh, interaction. So it still does HTTP applications, obviously, but now non-HTTP, so if I think SQL, uh, AMQP, if it's using TCP or TLS over TCP, I can now use that with the app gateway proxying capabilities. Now, it still lets me use a custom domain. It still lets me use app gateways, TLS certificate management capabilities, and it's available for the standard V2 and the web application firewall V2 SKUs. But when I think about web application firewall, one important caveat, the protection that the web application firewall provides does not apply, it does not inspect that TCP and TLS over TCP traffic. So yes, it will work, the listener will work through web application firewall, but it is not doing inspection on it today. An app gateway for containers has gone GA. So I did a whole video for this, and although it's sort of got app gateway in the name, this was really built from the ground up for Kubernetes. It's providing that layer seven load balancing of my workloads, and it's using Kubernetes primitives. That's really the big deal for this. So it's gonna be really natural for Kubernetes administrators, for developers to be able to leverage this without any knowledge of Azure. They can just use the native Kubernetes ideas. I'm supporting the ingress and gateway Kubernetes APIs. It has traffic splitting, weighted round robin, and mutual authentications to the backends, and again, Go and check out the full video if you want the details on that. But some of the huge benefits it gives me over what we have today is a near, near real-time convergence when I'm adding removing pods or routes, probes, any load balancing configuration within my Kubernetes YAML, it's near real-time convergence, which is a, a huge deal. And destination NAT, with my next generation firewall network virtual appliances within virtual WAN, so many different acronyms there, is now available. So basically now if you think about, hey, I have my next generation firewall with a, a public endpoint running in my virtual WAN scenario, it can do destination that. So it's offering a certain port. When that's spoken to, it will redirect it to some back end and then a different port to a different back end port uh, combinations. So now uh, we can do that 
with our virtual WAN and our third party network virtual appliances. On the storage side, so encryption at host is now available for the premium SSD V2 and ultra disk in some additional regions. So remember premium SSD V2 and ultra disk are the lowest latency, highest performing. They let you pick the IOPS and the throughput separately from the capacity. I can dynamically change the IOPS and the throughput while it's in use. Encryption at host is, well remember there's, there's local cache for those disks on the node. Well that is now encrypted with whatever encryption key is being used for the disk by the disk encryption set. And it's encrypted in transit. So from the storage to the node, it's encrypted as well. So now additional regions support that, Canada East, West Europe, South Central US, and West US 3. Database side, so NBC row compression for Custo TDS. Okay, what's all that? So null bitmap compressed row. If there's a null value in the past, we would think about it taking up a byte. Well, now with this, it will just take up one bit. So we're saving seven bits, which if you have a lot of nulls, adds up to a lot. Now TDS, TDS is the tabular data stream protocol. It's what I can use from a, an MS SQL client talking to a SQL database. But what happens here is the Custo through Azure Data Explorer, and there's some other services as well, they expose a TDS endpoint. So what that means is for my MS SQL client that speaks TDS, I can talk to Azure Data Explorer to do those different interactions, which means I can do things like enter, I'm doing enter authentication for that. Well, I'm now gonna take advantage of this compression. So if there were nulls, it can use one bit instead of a byte. So, hey, I'm just gonna get more efficient use of my bandwidth. And then Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL. Remember, this essentially is where I'm using the Citus extension. So I get that bigger scale, the, the higher performance. It used to be Postgres SQL hyperscale, but now it's Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL. Well now, through both the Azure CLI and the SDKs, so I'm thinking about SDKs for .NET, Go, Java, JavaScript, Python, I can support the full management of my resource. So that includes cluster creation. It includes the Postgres SQL Server parameter changes, um, cluster node additions, cluster node compute and storage scaling, all of that from the Azure CLI uh, and the SDKs. Postgres SQL flexible. It's always gonna be flexible from this point on. The single server is basically deprecated, going away. Minor version supports have been added. So it's 16.1, 15.5, 14.10, 13.13, 12.17, 11.22, yeah, I have to read those off. And then SQL hyperscale, elastic pool, now has zone redundancy. So remember zone redundancy means it's using the availability zones in a region. For each subscription, we see three availability zones. Each availability zone has independent power calling networking control plane. So if I think blast radius, something bad can happen at an entire data center. And if I'm using that zone redundancy, my instance is still resilient. So now my SQL hyperscale, which is that large scale SQL where the compute and the page service and the log service is separated, well now the elastic pool version that allows multiple database instances to share a pool of resource, well, I can use that zone redundancy. Miscellaneous. So Windows 365 had a whole bunch of updates. There's things we've covered before when they were in preview where well, they've gone GA. So I can set a 15 minute sign-in frequency. I can customize the boot sign-in page. Um, the shared and dedicated 365 boot has gone GA. There's the, the fast fail notification has gone GA. And managing my local PC settings from my cloud PC has gone GA. And then for the Windows 365 switch, well, that has got the desktop identifiers, the improved disconnect, the connection status. Uh, those have all gone GA as well. Azure OpenAI service now has the version three embedding model. So we're used to the ADA 002. Remember embedding is about taking some input and creating the multi-dimensional vector that represents the semantic meaning. That's really important when we use the natural language because different words can mean the same thing. The same word can mean different things. And so regular 
uh, lexical searches that match the exact term are not very good. And so we create these embeddings, these vectors that represent the meaning of what we're saying, which is really useful when we do retrieval augmented generation. When I want to get information that's pertinent that I want to send as part of my prompt to a large language model, well, we use these semantic searches. And I did a whole video about how that works, but now there's a new version. The new version has both a large and small. So it's 3,072 dimensions or 1,537 dimensions. But basically this has got much better multi-language retrieval. So that's the big deal with this version. There's also the GPT-35 Turbo uh, 0125 model is available. That's got some higher accuracy in different requested formats and also some better uh, returns for non-language function calls. Microsoft Defender Portal, this is probably the biggest announcement. No, not really. It has a dark mode. Uh, so now if I go to Defender, you'll just see here in the top corner, I can switch between light and dark mode. So uh, that, that's much better. So now I can get that lovely dark mode and there's still the light mode I can switch back if I wanted to. And then finally for today, we have this new conditional access authentication flow condition. And what this really allows me to do, might as well just show that quick, is in my conditions now, you'll see this authentications flow. So I'm looking at conditions, authentications flow is in preview. And we have two today, device code flow and authentication transfer. And the whole point here is that now for, so device code flow is that idea that sometimes you'll get some need to authenticate and it will show you a code and say, now go to this page and type that code in where you can't authenticate at that particular point. Well, that can be used for a phishing attack. And uh, someone's phones you up and say, hey, go to this page. I'm telling you this code to make, prove you are who you say you are. So it's an attack surface. So now for that device code flow, maybe I could add additional protections. Hey, it has to be hybrid joined. It has to be healthy from intern or defender status or whatever you want to do, certain location to increase the security and mean an attacker can't use it or I could just block it completely. Authentication transfer is if you ever installed Outlook, after you've installed it on your machine, it gives you a QR code. Say, hey, do you want to install this on your mobile device? When you scan that code, it installs the app and it transfers the authentication to that device as well. So that's the authentication transfer. I don't know if that's a huge attack surface commonly, but I can add uh, controls to that as well now. And I'll do a, a little video on that next week. And that was it. So as always, I hope that was useful. Quite a few updates this week. Until the next video, take care.